So what made you first get into painting and drawing? Was there a... when, I, when I was a child, I think I want. I had vague ideas that I might want to be a dancer uh, because I always liked showing off. <laughs> and I always, I think it was a great disappointment to my father because I wasn't a pretty child. And uh, um, I suppose I've been trying to make up for it ever since. Well, possibly with makeup, you know, as well. And trying to be vivacious and distract from how I really look. <laughs> and, uh, um, but it uh, it can colour your whole life. Yeah, but I've always wanted to paint and draw, and, uh, and I feel as if I can't be without it, mm. because that's my identity. Mm. Uh, and, and then, I think, when I was in the infant school, I was uh, honoured by the fact that I had to take my drawings around with the other classes and, and show them. Mm. That's when I probably first, you know, mm. thought, oh, well, you could show off them as well. But I've got to the age now and I, I feel as if I want to do something that I want to do. I don't want to go on doing the crooked billets for the rest of my life, which I started to do when I was there. Uh, well, I suppose when I was about 17, mm. and I was being nearly 84 now, one feels perhaps it's like writing the same um, letter over and over again, mm. or playing the same tune. Yeah. <laughs> what would you like to be painting or drawing instead then? Uh, I want to do something that shows what I feel about being my age without depressing people. Uh, and something that isn't like a photograph because mm. I'm afraid a lot of the people that come in would love it if it was like a photograph because mm. you know when they show you on their phones quite often uh, I've got a I've got a, a cousin who does lovely ones uh, and then they flick through it and usually it's a horse's head uh, or elephants or something like nothing remotely connected with their life or, or what they feel. In the end you think they don't feel anything, perhaps. Mm. It has to be something as a photograph and mm. they can say, oh, isn't that lovely? Look, the fur looks so real. And um, you think, what is the point of, of trying to paint what I feel about Lee, perhaps, mm. or, or what I feel about anything? They just want something that's either a, an illustration mm. uh, and, they say things like, do you do the pottery as well? And, and of course, I feel what everyone said, they, they just murmur, isn't it lovely? And go out. Mm. Um, and it's like beating your head up against a brick wall. Mm. Uh, so of, of course, one begins to think, well, what am I going to do with my paintings? Because I'm quite prolific people say, are all these yours? And then when you say yes, they say, that one over there, is that? And in the end you feel like, oh, I just told you, they're all mine. Mm. And because um, now I feel as if I'm getting increasingly irritable and unreasonable with poor souls that come in. Because the other day, a couple came in with two children who were lovely actually. Uh, I said to the little boy, um, how old are you? And uh, he said nine, very seriously looking at me. And I asked him to come, if he'd like to come into the studio. And he, he sort of nodded once again. And I said, all these paintings of mine, do you like them? Uh, I looked very seriously and said, I draw. <laughs> and but immediately we, we linked up together and it was lovely. Mm. And, I said, well, well, would you bring in some of your work and show me if you'd like to? And I could see how he took it so seriously. And the children are more open than the grown-ups. And there was a, other weeks a little boy who was four. I said, what do you think of my work? He said, love it. Well, his little son up, I thought. <laughs> so have you begun the work on these other items that aren't uh, portraits? Yes, 
I had one that I did of um, a doctor's surgery based on it. Uh, and I know this is going to sound odd, but I thought of waiting in there and how everyone usually looks very worried. Mm. And you look round and all there's up is posters about other illnesses you could possibly have. Mm. So I'm, I'm leaving a painting uh, to the surgery that I go to oh. in my will. Mm. They, have, they can make the choice, so hopefully they'll have to have it. Because I thought, just if you could be looking at something like a tree in Brussels, yes. something about life. Yeah. Uh, uh, something that's lush and healthy, mm. you know. No, not whether you could possibly have something dreadful coming that you've got wrong with cancer or something mm. like that. Yeah. What you've got to look out for. Um, so there's this three people sitting there. One of them actually looks like my mother when she she wasn't well because she, I'm hard to contrive. Whether it's because of her, I don't mm. know because. She used to, well I think she had an unhappy life because my father left when I was 18 and uh, he'd been carrying on with other women. Not that I blame him really because she was a nagger but I think it was a tough life for her and she wanted to dance her way through life really and uh, he didn't dance. It's funny how women marry men that don't do things. Mm. that they want to do. They think they'll probably change them. <laughs> I think it's impossible to do that really. Even if a man is madly enough, he, he wouldn't be true to himself, would he? Anyway, have I had any reaction from this at all? Only, uh, that was in June, you see, the, the art trail. No, no reaction at all for anybody. Nobody said, oh, that's interesting. Except, uh, the other week some people came in uh, and they were studying it intently and they said, uh, oh that is interesting, what made you do that? And so I might explain. And they were, apparently worked uh, at a doctor's in London and uh, they said that they would uh, take, uh, well they take one of my cards, uh, my website on it, but unfortunately it's not on the website. but. Uh, just to have somebody notice it, mm. it was so wonderful. And I did another one actually, which I, I haven't framed or done anything with because I thought it's not quite right. Because I used to see a woman wheeling this poor man around, uh, and uh, I think it was obviously his, his wife, and looked much younger than him. And he had this, uh, he was quite elderly. A smile on his face, and I thought, as if he might possibly be demented. But he looked, he looked ill, and uh, I was going to call it. It's all right. He's no trouble. And I thought of the rest of the world, just carry on, you know. And she'd be pushing him down, and he'd be smiling. Mm. And uh, in fact, I think I smiled at him and said hello because I thought, just for some. Sort of as if people aren't ignoring him, and uh, but of course one doesn't want to make people terribly sad. No. Um, so the desire to make them laugh as well is, is within me, and I do. I know I do make people laugh because with stories of my life, what it was like with the, the cockle boats getting. I think uh, it's, it's wanting to share the experience of life with other people and I don't think we do in the ordinary way because no. it's hello, have a nice day yeah. and you go, you know, what's, did you watch television last night? It's all small talk. Isn't it? Mm. And there's nothing, something, you think, well look, what do you feel inside yourself? Mm. Don't you feel anything at all? Um, I suppose in a way I can understand people getting into a rhythm of just working and working and working and pushing everything aside. Just going down to work, wondering what if a millionaire is going to come in today, <laughs> but if he does, 
He'll buy some pottery. <laughs> or a fridge magnet. <laughs> and I'm thinking, when I get round down to work, well, Richard be there. Uh, I don't think Katie will be. But, uh, and uh, has any rain come in last night? Mm -hmm. Because the roof, the roof is rather terrible. And also the drains. The church has got one of my paintings, but um, I don't quite know if I gave it to them. Or they hinted that I should give it to them. But all I know is when I, when I went and some years afterwards, they got entirely the wrong colour mountain and frame. I try not to do it. He's a lovely man. Uh, always cheerful. I wonder what the secret of life is really. And I know when I get to the end of the road and I look across at the water, my heart lifts up, uh, or something lifts up, you know, I suddenly feel much better all the time thinking, now as I turn the corner, I mustn't, I mustn't rip my plunge to the floor. Sometimes I feel that the only time you're really in touch with reality when something like that happens. Uh, <coughs> but I, d I don't really recommend that. <laughs> uh, You've got a plaster cast of some bosoms on the wall. And I thought, well, really? Doesn't he know what they like? Uh, uh, but it's such a small area. But it was the only time I lived on my own. And, uh, it was lovely. I really felt that I might float away, and I quite know why, and that life was going to be a great adventure. I think I must have been about 40 or 38 at the time. Uh, and I used to go into Heather's little like, sort of bed set, and uh, before I went, particularly before I went disco dancing, and asked her if I was, what I was wearing. So, uh, and I remember she used to say to me, no Sheila, you can't go like that. It was, it was hot pants and I thought, well if I wore a blouse, I used to go dancing with her as well and, uh, and that was great fun because I remember once she danced with me, with this man and she said to me, he drinks. And I didn't know whether she meant the one I was with or the one she was with. Look round hastily to see if there isn't any car suddenly zooming up behind you. I've got hearing aids of course which uh, people think, oh how sad. The only thing about it is, it's like listening to but something, the sound of, of being on the radio. Uh, and if anyone gets near, in a way, I suppose it could be a form of uh, protection, uh, they make whistling, whistling noises. Because it's even worse if they get too you know. uh, Especially if you haven't told them. Uh, and one does tend to bond though. As we pass this uh, emporium, I think of when it wasn't there and this is part of the party out. And quite often when you've looked in the window, there's been a terrible painting I think they think is an abstract. It might have gone uh, No, it's at the back. It's at the back. And you think some person got away with that. Uh, I think they're just so, well, if I do something like that big, that would be considered natural. Um, with a sinking heart, I see that Richard isn't there, and nobody else is there, and I'm going to have to see if I can open the door or uh, just, uh, see what's in the Oh, I won't be there yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go. 
Give me the bed to chill. Sorry, I'm sorry. I really, I'm extremely lucky. Oh! It's open. <laughs> it's open. After all that. It's open. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Cut the door. Look at all the way. Good. Alright. Oh, well. something large, you know, you suddenly think, oh, now have I wasted all that paint? Shall I start again? Um, I think that there's a saying, isn't it, that your parents picked you up, and I think they possibly do, but I mean, it just generation after generation, and uh, I know my mother would always say things to me, depressing, depressing things to me, uh, and uh, also brought me up to think I wasn't quite strong. I remember her saying to the doctor, she's never been strong. That's what she's been brought up by the thought that you've never been strong. <laughs> or as she said, you make, you make yourself look a sight. And of course, when I was an art student, uh, I went through a phase of uh, uh, being, I suppose, unsure of myself and having an unfortunate uh, relationship there, then with somebody who I, I, I realised now look rather like a spib and he used to uh, grease his hair with uh, Vaseline. If you ever touched anyone's hair and they've got Vaseline on it and the weather's cold it's quite terrifying. But <laughs> he, uh, he looked older than he was. I suppose that fascinated, fascinated me and he used to smoke cigars and uh, and what they and what wore what they used to call brothel creepers, I think. Uh, he went out with my friend to begin with, Mox, who was a little roly poly woman with a bus before I seemed to have one. So we must, and we both used to go out wearing the new look. <laughs> we both got these suits. We must have looked ridiculous, and uh, we planned that when we left, we were going to sell around the coast of Britain. We, we didn't know anything about boats and paint on the way. I don't quite know how it was going to happen. And I know she was into making petticoats. She think, what's I going to do with it? But I met her years afterwards, just by accident. And she said, I'm just looking for some material to make a waist petticoat. I thought, well, things do change, do they? But uh, she, I think, must have got married to a foreign student. She was more voluptuous than I was at the time. More than it's anything to do with it, I don't know. Uh, We've been here 24 years, and uh, we own it between us. Uh, Richard, Richard Baxter and Kate Baxter, and uh, we managed to sort of struggle on. Richard takes his work further afield because he has more energy and he's much younger. I know when. Uh, we were first here, I remember my hairdresser, you think hairdresser? Uh, um, said, you're, at your age, you should, you're 60, why, why do you want to, you know, I said, well, I'm not just going to sit and wait for death. Uh, um, I, and at that time, I was living with my framer, who was, uh, uh, I, li I lived with her 25 years, and then, uh, unfortunately, was there and die. Um, uh, really, without him, I wouldn't have had anything. I wouldn't have had a house. Or, uh, and uh, he was a very kind man to me. I was able to leave 
uh, the job that I had, because I was trying to fit that in with painting, I, I worked part time as a window dresser in one of the local shops called, I think it's called Vanity. Uh, Vanity was the Vanity Seth the Lord. And uh, of course, his idea of window dressing wasn't my idea. You, uh, he wanted every space filled up, and he would come outside and look at it with you and say, "There's a space there," and you think, "Well, that's not the idea. You don't, you don't fill up spaces. You have a design." And and the only thing one had to work with quite often was tea stands. If you ever try to arrange a rather nice night dress on a tea stand that sort of droops forward. Uh, you can't really do anything with it. But uh, anyway, that was a happy time in a, in a way because I was earning a little bit of money. Because uh, my second marriage had broken up. Uh, we, we lived in a caravan and uh, it was very small and uh, I have to think what name was it now. Roy used to trip over the feet of the easel and um, used to get bothered. I remember he punched the wardrobe. Well, I suppose it could have been me actually who punched him in. But uh, this, I know, is all very muddled up, but as you get older, you can't remember which bit comes first. And Ian and I, who's also another artist and uh, much younger than me, was uh, sort of like 12 years younger than me because now. I don't think it's quite so noticeable. Ho hopefully in a way, but in another way. <laughs> uh, he's got the same sense of humour as me, thank God. Because quite often when I've, I've been out with, uh, with people, quite often the op op opposite sex, they were a bit alarmed after a while and sort of looked nervously at me and I think this is something, well I think this, this is something wrong with her brain um, and uh, I think John said to me once that I turned everything into a bloody joke <laughs> but I thought it's the only way I can face life really um, and I think, see the culprit and people come in here and they say Oh, I just love the smell of it. And quite often it's these tins that I haven't put the lids on properly and it's gone a bit mouldy. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the children are lovely though, I must admit that. Uh, and of course they appear to know more about art than I do. <laughs> which is rather disturbing. Uh, the paintings on the wall here, I was done in the 1960s. Uh, when I was going out with a couple boat skipper, uh, there's a, a drawing of him here, uh, and I did a portrait from the drawing. I've also got a painting of him that I did, uh, a big one, when he was uh, visiting me once, uh, and he was uh, in the bed. Only a single bed, really. <laughs> I'd stop with just his vest on, I, I stopped sort of there. Uh, and uh, what I liked about him was that he, he smelled of the sea. Uh, and when he kissed you, he was like sinking into a feather bed. Of course, he had big lips, I think. But sometimes I think you can tell people's natures if they've got little mean lips. You think they won't be sort of, they'd be all tight and closed up and they won't talk about the sort of things you want. Uh, mind you, he was a, a gambler and uh, used to borrow money from me and forget about it. Um, his wife left him in carpet slipper, slippers and uh, riding a bicycle furiously away. Uh, when I first met him, I was sitting on the beach sketching. Uh, and he came up to me and he said, uh, Hello, mate. <laughs> All right. And sort of walking with him. I mean, he, people used to say to me, Why? Why have you become attached to someone like that? Because, well, I can't explain in detail, really. Uh, and he used to... He used to come in 
early in the morning after he'd been out on the boat and uh, getting to bear with me. I didn't really want him all the time. I, I think if most people were truthful, they don't really want someone all the time. I'm not saying, you know, be moral, but it becomes too ordinary and I, th I think unfortunately what women want is different to what men want perhaps. Uh, they, they want a little bit of excitement, excitement and varied expression uh, of themselves. And, uh, but they're, I can't say that I speak for everyone, but quite often the women that come in here they seem to think I've had a colourful life and they seem rather envious. When I think of the dreary days in the caravan, wondering if he'd come home, because he used to go and, the second husband, Roy, he used to go and uh, stay with his mother. Uh, who he, when I first met him, he said he hated. But there you are, I suppose, the link between them. Um, <laughs> Artists flock to me because of the light beside the wide waters of the estuary and because wherever you look, there are pictures. Sheila Appleton has her studio in the village, which she shares with potter Richard Baxter. She's been painting for a living for 30 years now and can often be found by the sea wall, sketching and harvesting ideas and choosing colours. Trying to represent the natural beauty of the place with oil on canvas is a constant and satisfying challenge. When I first started painting and going out sketching, I think one of the first memories was people coming up to me and talking about my work. And they were very well meaning, but it did stop you being able to concentrate on what you were doing. Uh, it seems, uh, as being an artist, you need never be lonely because people rush up to you immediately and quite often they say, I, I do a bit myself, and your heart sinks. <laughs> other's work and make comments about it. Some of his work I like very much and the others I don't like so much. I try to be diplomatic and I'm sure he does the same with me. I myself used to do a little bit of pottery and so you know I, I know what it's like to actually produce something. It's almost like having a child I suppose because it's something that you've produced and nobody else can actually do something quite the same. I did of uh, where I'm living at the moment before it was changed into a house uh, which was uh, fortunately left to me by my late partner who was my framer and uh, without him I wouldn't have owned anything in my life as you choke back a sob but it is difficult if you haven't got a base really to start uh, trying to concentrate on your work and after living in the bank house, uh, living in a caravan with two cats and an unsuitable husband, uh, and then being at home with my mother, who was rather depressing, uh, and, and kept on saying things about my father, about how he'd crucified her, and I thought I've got to get, I've got to get away from my mother. You know, so I think that's one of the reasons why I first got married, apart from thinking I was in love, of course, as one does. Uh, I met my first husband uh, through doing a painting of his friend and uh, um, he was in the Remy in the army and of course when I saw him in a uniform uh, he looked lovely even though he was, he was half an inch taller than me which was rather sort of frustrating because it meant you could never wear shoes with a heel 
which of course immediately women look better if they've got a heel on, it throws the bosom forward and, and so on. And uh, uh, anyway, I married him and it, it, he had no money either, so we lived, which was so funny, was first of all we lived in a furnished flat in uh, Lee, uh, and then I, and I left my job because I thought we were moving to Birmingham because he came from Birmingham. Uh, he used to call me Winch. Uh, and uh, he was like to be, he smelled of geraniums. I never found out why. Uh, and uh, uh, so in the end, uh, we ended up uh, living back with my mother because I went back to work because I was bored and there was nowhere I could paint where I was living. It was a, a uh, house in Dundonald Drive, and not even a separate flat, but just a few rooms. Uh, when I think of youngsters nowadays expecting to get a house as soon as they're together, uh, it seems amazing, but of course each generation has said that, I believe, in a, in a bit of sort of twisted way about the generation following them. Um, and my, my husband uh, tried to help me with my work, but he was, a, he was an engineer and working in a in uh, a factory called Rotrios and, and uh, Hose, that should be actually. Uh, and it's, it's a strange feeling because I used to look from the window and see him carrying across what was a field then, though it was Chelsea Avenue, since been built on, uh, and my heart used to lift for a while I, until he came in. I don't know what I was expecting, but really we came from two different cultures in life. Mm. I hope that doesn't make me sound like a snob, but we didn't really have anything in common, uh, even though one loved each other in a sort of peculiar way. Uh, um, we had no privacy because my mother used to come downstairs uh, and uh, we didn't have a separate flat or anything. And unfortunately the house belonged to my aunt anyway, so that was a difficult sort of thing. Um, and I suppose I was looking for someone else, really unconsciously, maybe, when I met someone who I'd once gone carol singing with when I was an art student. And if only I'd remembered, I didn't like him particularly then, but it was exciting. Uh, at the time, I was, I was uh, still trying to paint, um, but working as a window dresser in Dixon's, um, Mr. Dixon's commissioned my first painting and I think probably to, all, uh, uh, to his great horror uh, it turned out to be a queue of people queuing outside the gas works for coke but just the sort of thing that his wife would like in the lounge um, but I was into social documents uh, even even then I was doing elderly people in shelters with, with couples maybe the other side madly kissing and this elderly lady or gentleman sitting there looking rather as if the end was nigh. Uh, I, I do think how we are totally unaware of other people, especially when you're young. I suppose it's a natural thing. Uh, so eventually I ended up sort of running away from my husband. But he guessed there was something wrong because I quite often I used to be there in the evening sort of choking back a sob. Uh, and uh, and he found a poem written to me on top of the wardrobe. I mean, why put it on top of the wardrobe? But why not just throw it away? Or oh. <laughs> so he, he gathered something w was going on, and uh, I mean, it happens to so many people, really. Uh, and if if you've got lots of imagination, you think this is going to be absolutely wonderful, uh, even though your heart is tearing at you, and and you're thinking. Could I possibly have both of them uh, on different days, you know, so I didn't get fed up with one or the other? Uh, but it doesn't work out like that. And I remember that the day before I left my husband, I think I was in this fashion parade at, at Dixon's, and uh, thinking this is living to the full. And um, my my husband was in the audience, and the other one, who was going to be the other husband, unfortunately because in those days you had to get married, um, was waiting outside for me. And I thought, my God, this is absolutely with living, in, you know, uh, uh, until you actually get down to the realities. Um, 
with the caravan and the fact that he didn't laugh when we couldn't get the bed down, uh, um, I suddenly began to think, I wonder if this is going to go wrong. Um, and of course eventually it did. It was like being punished for what one had done. There was only three buses a day, so you couldn't get really away from the caravan site. It was in, it was in Hockley. It was called the Dome. We ended up calling it the Dome. And uh, um, to just be imprisoned in a caravan uh, or, uh, was, was rather terrible because it was small. And my husband, when I met him, didn't even have a job. He, he was just on the, well, I don't know why, um, prospect of looking for a job. And uh, he got, anyway, he got this job that's totally unsuitable for uh, as a salesman selling different projects uh, and really he couldn't do it uh, and also he got some slip discs uh, and uh, so he used to lay in bed a lot and I said it was a very small caravan you had to edge your way by the bed because there was hardly any room to walk so it was really like being punished and uh, um, so I re realised this was all going to go wrong, I suppose. And I started coming down to Old Lee and trying to paint and draw as much as possible. And I did life modelling. So I was in touch with the art school. Uh, and uh, he used to threaten to bite me, love bites, so it would show when I was life modelling. Uh, I mean, it's, it, one can laugh at it now, but it was rather, it was rather tragic in a way. And I uh, know I used to meet my ex-husband uh, in the high street and take him tins of Irish stew because I was worried about how he was. <laughs> it's a <shame. laughs> That's why I've always thought that it's very, very difficult just to confine your love to one person. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know whether it's the right way to think but to me it seems natural if you just stem it all up and obviously if that person dies like a lot of women that come in to the studio and talk to me uh, are bemoaning the loss of a husband or somebody else's husband maybe and they can't transfer their love to anyone else as if it's sort of stemmed off well I think there are many types of love and you can't expect the same love as you get older you can't expect the same love to be transferred to another person it's just a different sort of love but he's more of a sentimentalist than I I think most men are more sentimental than women and women are thinking of practical things like we haven't got anything for dinner or but, which of course drags one's mind into a different direction to thinking I'm going to be a great artist and I'll just concentrate on, <laughs> on whatever I'm working on. <laughs> My late partner, who I lived with here, here who was started off as my framer, um, and I'd known him for some years, uh, he had a difficult relationship with his wife and uh, they were, became divorced, um, but he had uh, a family and a very nice son and uh, the two girls were very good as well. One of them became a great friend of mine but she died of cancer. That's why I've had in the past raffled some of my work for cancer research. Um, I don't know whether really with charities anything is achieved because I find now they're still sending letters to me asking for the same amount that I've raised uh, with the paintings. Uh, and I, my, um, my pension isn't even a hundred pounds. Uh, and I have to sort of just give a small amount, you know, whether they're hoping all the time it's going to be the same amount, I don't know. This is a, a portrait a friend did of me when I was living in the bank house and she was living in 
a sort of like bed sit next to me uh, and uh, she did a, she did another one actually but my uh, late frame I should say that I lived with I used it as a, spl a splashboard I discovered on <laughs> I don't, I don't think it meant he hated me. I think it was just a, a practical sort of man and thought, oh, it wants to be laying around, I'll just use it. Uh, um, these are, uh, this one here I did when I was, uh, just left the art school, and I must have been about 18. You, you can see even there I had terrible hair. <laughs> and uh, these, these are others that, uh, I've done over the years. Uh, sometimes, as you can see, I'm looking rather depressed there. But one has to acknowledge the fact that one's getting older. Um, and sometimes I bring people round about here when they're talking about portraiture and, and so on, how they're trying to do it and how difficult it is. And, and of course it is because as soon as you look at yourself in a mirror, you get that haunted look as if you're a wild animal looking through the grasses. and. Uh, I've always been aware that I have a very long nose. Over the years, I'm afraid, it's made me terribly sad because I thought I would probably live a completely different life if I had a darling little short nose. But really, I quite like long noses, especially on men. They seem very kissable. Uh, it's something that nature does to oneself, I suppose. I, I, I suppose, really, one feels as if one wants to make some mark on the, to uh, leave something behind even if people are going to be saying we don't want what to do with it uh, and I thought my parents I would like to do something about them because they weren't happily married and uh, it's the usual story I suppose uh, and uh, my mother really was more of a butterfly type person uh, and she wanted to dance and have fun I think well, she ended up marrying my father, who was very handsome, uh, and uh, according to my aunt, his sister, who wasn't very nice, that he was on the rebound from this one here, which was in, these are all done mainly from photographs. Um, so it's a bit limiting, because I think you shouldn't paint from photographs, really, but, and I had a terrible job to try and get my mother's nose right, you see, because... <laughs> She had a long nose as well. I, 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 she could look rather lovely. I mean, that was one of her before she got married. And apparently she had very long hair. Why on earth she had it cut, I don't know, because I think that was one of her attributes. And uh, apparently went down past her waist. But And she said to me proudly, I was one of the first to have my hair shingled. This, this would probably be in the, the 1920s. Uh, and she loved dancing. Uh, my father, of course, didn't dance. Uh, so it made it, it made it a bit difficult. And he wanted to be a writer. Well, I don't really know exactly what happened in their life. But um, I think she had pretensions of grandeur or something like that. Because apparently when I was a child, a baby in arms, he was committed to prison for I don't know how long um, for um, from doing some perjury, no that's not the right word really, um, for embezzling some money uh, and uh, in those days of course it was considered so dreadful and it wasn't spoken on, you were shunned by your neighbours, but of course now nothing you know you think oh how colorful did something like that oh well it doesn't really matter um, my aunt made it worse because uh, she told me after my mother had died that how my mother used to come round to her or to the family and cry uh, and they think well oh, that's that's dreadful and when my mother told me about it she said another sad thing she she said she used to uh, go out during the day and do so she didn't think about it so much and do the housework in the evenings um, and when you think there's no surprise really that she used to tell me things like she'd been crucified and how he'd ruined her life I, I suppose that was maybe one of the things that made me think 
You shouldn't base it around one person. I mean, I suppose religious people can base it around God and get over everything, maybe that way. Um, but this was one of him before he was married. Uh, I have got a very good photograph of that, and also another one of the wedding. Uh, and you could see how attractive he was. And uh, I can remember him uh, having rather strange friends and, and uh, I can't remember him all that much but I know I really want to I wanted to impress him uh, and it was very difficult because as a little girl I was I think I was quite attracted because I was sort of my mother used to knit me like pixie hood and things like that with angora and he used to call me snowball and things like that but I felt as I got older that really I wasn't I wasn't attractive you don't realise when you're when you're young that you are attractive anyway because of how fresh you look and, and your skin. And uh, um, in in the end, just before he left, I didn't know he was going to leave. Of course, but he took me up to London to try and get a job for me. You know, and uh, we went round the studios, commercial art studios and you had to take some of your work with you and it was very nerve-wracking and of course I, I probably looked a bit of a sight as well um, I didn't feel very self-confident especially with my father with me nowadays of course it would never happen but, you know they'd probably go on their own and um, I even got so nervous I left some of my work behind and I found they were doing things like uh, trying to undo paper sculpture and things like that. They didn't seem to understand. Uh, and I realised that I, I wasn't going to get a job as a commercial artist. Really. I wasn't commercial enough. Uh, and then, you know, he started talking about me getting work in, a, in a, an ordinary office and leaving my work around so they could see it. I think I thought they'd just say, would you mind throwing this in the rubbish bin? <laughs> and there wouldn't be any point. Um, so anyway, he did leave. Uh, I'm not sure whether my mother turned him out because she she found out that he'd been uh, cohabiting with someone. He only came home weekends and uh, th this was... Um, I don't know whether it's a great shock for him, must have been, I think. Uh, and she never, she never got over it. Uh, um, yeah, it made her rather bitter. But she could be very funny. She did have, in later life, she did have boyfriends. But uh, she used to criticise them quite a lot. I remember she said, she, one that I got to know, she said, you know, he wears braces. Uh, and then, she said, she said things like, <laughs> it was this club she belonged to, uh, when I went out with him, uh, she said the taxi driver thought he was my father. <laughs> I, think, I think actually, some of the things she thought of, some of the sort of things that I think, she could be, she could be funny, um, but it was difficult to get her to be happy, really, because there usually used to be something wrong. And, she thinks she's got illnesses, and of course, eventually she did. She had um, cancer, and uh, um, she died at the age of 85. You see, and as I'm nearing that age, well, I'll be 84 this year. I think this has made me want to do this because I, I thought I got to make some impact, even if I don't know who won really, but to prove that I've, I've lived. very old painting of mine, uh, of myself, when I was probably, uh, I should imagine, about 40 years old. Uh, and um, I was going dancing in tops then. Uh, this is a friend of mine, who I still occasionally go dancing with, Beda. Uh, I've all, I discovered the love of disco dancing when I was uh, living on my own in the bank house and a woman I got to know that wanted me to do a painting of her after she saw a painting that I had done with my husband uh, uh, suggested that I came, well asked me if I'd like to go to a party that she threw 
uh, so uh, I said yes and they actually had disco music on and uh, I started dancing and I, I thought well you don't have to have a partner, how wonderful. So you don't have that agony of uh, like sitting down and waiting for someone to look you over and, and ask, you to, ask you to dance. Um, so I think this is when I, I began to think I can, I can do this and I remember dancing as a child in um, in boots years ago. I don't mean actually wearing boots because I remember I was wearing like little gaiters. You can tell how many years ago it was, but I can just just remember boots used to have, believe it or not, a little quartet, uh, and it was along the high street. Uh, you can, if you look up, you can see some of the buildings are lovely. I mean they've been ruined with the bottom part. Uh, and uh, I was there with my grandma, actually, my mother, and I saw this little boy get up and dance. I think I probably might have been about four or five, and he got a box of bonbons. And I must have thought, well, I'd like a box of bonbons. So I wanted to get up and dance with him. My mother was saying, no, don't. My, my, my grandma said, let her do it, you see. So I got up and danced. Uh, I can't remember if I got a box of bonbons, but I think it must have started from then, if you see it. But instead of bonbons now, I get people coming up to me and say, um, were you a dancer? But they spoil it all by saying, how old are you? And immediately, your heart sinks. You think, well, look, does that matter? You know, it's like you're still moving. And then they say, of course nowadays, they're all taking selfies. Um, can I have my photo with you? I mean, one of them said to me, I think you're a fantastic party animal. And I only heard the word animal at first. Because you see, I'm, I'm deaf anyway, so I take the hearing aids out. Because uh, the, the music is so terrible. Usually, I put, um, uh, you know, something in my ears, plugs, so I can't hear it. Just move to the rhythm. And, um, I said one night, I said, uh, I was 101, and what's so awful, the woman believed me. I think the rest of the evening, I think I've got to go home. Uh, I usually get quite friendly with the bouncers, because quite often they're nicer than the men that are actually in there. Uh, and you find nowadays, everyone quite often just leaps up in the air and doesn't do anything really very much. Or, um, I, th I think, well, don't they, can't they feel the, the rhythm? And of course the women go slightly over the top really. I, I think they're more frightening than the men. Uh, over the years I've done various uh, paintings of, of discos and uh, um, sketches quite often are there. Only very, very tiny ones on because people otherwise would want to crowd on and see what you've done. Uh, and uh, I find that uh, the women are usually more outrageous than the men. And there's one that I've been going to recently called Tropicana, the Cliff Pavilion, and I'm doing a large painting based on that. Uh, it's this one on the easel over here. I haven't, I haven't finished it because once again, when I start something large, if I'm not careful, in between I'm trying to do local views because that's what the public wants usually. Uh, and I've got a, a friend of mine, I say a friend of mine, which I met years ago at a disco, uh, and she's quite brash in the things she says. In fact, I, I find it rather difficult, her remaining a friend over the years, because she came in, she usually says, Hello, gorgeous! When you're feeling particularly repellent, and, um, and then she can say things to you like, You made your stuff, what were you wearing? I used to go dancing with her, you see, but her, her way of dancing, I met her at the, the uh, West uh, Hotel, was more sort of like with her eye on the men and sort of things like this, you know. But, and she asked me to dance, that's how we got friendly. Uh, and uh, I can remember some of the men saying things like, just the sort of woman you'd like to take to meet your mother. But I think they liked her because she was attractive. Uh, I used to feel absolutely terrible next to her, really, because I was, I was more sort of withdrawn, I think, even though I loved the dancing. And 
uh, eventually, eventually I think, I did, well I did have a partner years ago, he's got gout now, might even much younger than me, and we used to do this routine to Tamla Motown, and um, while we were doing it I felt as if I loved him, but of course after a while you discover that person can be boring once they stop dancing, but he was a fantastic dancer, uh, and uh, we, we used to do this routine as actually as if we were facing an audience. Uh, and there's, then <laughs> there was another friend I used to go dancing with, but he got a bit amorous on the way home. Uh, and his style wasn't quite the same style as me. But I did once go with my um, late partner and he said to me, you never told me it was like hell. <laughs> and he didn't really, he didn't really want to dance, but Four years I've been going with somebody who thought I was sexy. Well, I think that was the reason to begin with. <laughs> and he's, he's, a lovely, he's a lovely man. Usually when people say that, they're going to destroy the person in the next sentence. But he, he's really very nice and he looks like me, which is, which is strange. I think sometimes people think he's my son. He's got high cheekbones. Not much hair and a nose like mine. You think, would that be possible? But, um, but he's dancing to the beat of another drum. You think, but who, who else would want to take an 83 year old woman to a disco? They think, well, no, she might be ill on the way. Or <laughs> I have fallen over a couple of times, but <laughs> not touch, touch wood, touch wood. Not recently, um, because now, as I think I said before, people don't tend to do a, a sort of resonant interpretation of the music. It usually seems as if it's uh, tribal, tribal now, and, and uh, I, I can't quite understand it, but I think as if the women usually are all together laughing and, and uh, so, some of them are quite crude with sort of sexual gestures to the men, you know, and I think, how oh, would get so desperate really, and uh, exposing too much of themselves when there's too much there, uh, like very large ladies with, uh, with great plunges and um, a huge thighs, though I can imagine being a man, I think, um, um, that sort of voluptuous being wonderful in the wind, especially when the heat has gone on, you know, and, uh, and when you get to know them, you realise that you've misjudged them because they seem very brash, because a lot of them are trying to get over failed marriages or um, something wrong with the child they've had, and uh, it's so easy to misjudge people. But, uh, um, they dress up for this particular one. I, I usually wear an all-in-one, as you think that isn't a corset, but I think they used to call them jumpsuits years ago. Uh, I realise I'm probably too old to wear something like that. And quite often a hat, you know, which gives you that air of mystery. Um, when I had my cataract done, I, I wore sunglasses. Uh, uh, I don't you notice at the moment, but I've got a bruise there. And I probably, if I go on Friday, I probably wear glasses then. You know, sunglasses, I've got um, a blue pair, so it doesn't look, it might be a fashion accessory, you see. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's frightening getting ready. Like most women, I think, don't know what to wear. Hastily putting one first one thing on another. Uh, um, but the thrill of it, it's like going on stage. Uh, really quite thrilling. Probably commissioned one to do here some years ago now. 
the council with a record uh, the whole thing. I don't yeah. think that I don't think they're bothered now. Um, no. Uh, it's all progress, progress, I think. Mm. Mm. I do seem to not lose their way. Not exactly correct. We've got the roof a bit too high, but never mind. I thought one could do it. Mm. That, that one actually is before, that was the first one mm -hmm. I did. No, that was the first one. See, that's a follow-on for that, actually. Yeah, but the scale is, right. is different. Yes. You know, it was a sort of follow-up from that one. Well, you've done that in just about, just over an hour. So that's mm. really yeah. quick, isn't it? I mean, My you know, bottom hurt in the oh, right. It's been really interesting, Sheila. Has it? Thank you very well, much at, indeed. At first, it was, wasn't fascinating. It was abs so. It's all been absolutely fascinating. Oh, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>